Washington Heights is a neighborhood of voices and stories. Those of immigration, refuge, Americanization, and reinvention. The story of the neighborhood itself is a remarkable chapter in New York's history. One in which millions began their lives anew, delighting in their proximity to scenic parks, dramatic vistas, and easy access to the heart of the metropolis. For German-speaking Jews fleeing the Nazis, Washington Heights was fertile ground on which to build new lives. There, they could retain what they loved best about German and Jewish culture, while committing to the exercise of becoming American. There, they found a community of family, neighbors, parks, synagogues, Jewish businesses, continuity, and also change. This exhibition explores and documents the experience of the German Jewish refugees of Washington Heights through the collections of Leo Beck Institute and other institutions in the neighborhood. So we're here today um, with uh, Ralph Blumenthal and uh, Ralph was with the New York Times for many years, uh, but his beginnings are in Inwood and in Oav Shalom. Right. And David Brown is here from the Leo Beck Institute. He's going to show us uh, this fascinating exhibit uh, about Washington Heights. And uh, we're going to see it from uh, many perspectives. Uh, we all know what we know, but we don't know what other people know. And that's what, it's, that's what learning's about. Let's, let's begin. Okay. So when did your family come to the Washington Heights and where did they okay. live? All right, they actually came to Inwood, uh, which is north of Washington Heights. They came in 1929. My parents got married in Berlin and came to America right after that, basically on their honeymoon, and settled first in, um, I believe, in Astoria. Uh, spoke no English. Um, and um, my father would tell me that the only words he knew were hamburger, so they ate hamburger every day for lunch. This is a map, apparently, of Inwood as well as... The site of some of George Washington's most crucial battles Washington Heights was rural in character until the second half of the 19th century, when affluent New Yorkers began building estates on the land. By 1870, the name Washington Heights had come into use. For that, uh, I remember, I mean, they called it the Fourth Reich. Right. Uh, they called it uh, uh, Frankfurt on the Hudson. But did you parents told me stories of crossing to New Jersey on the uh, ferry. In 1923, Othmar Amman, a Swiss-born architect and engineer, proposed a bridge design to connect New York City and New Jersey across the Hudson. A marvel of construction and engineering, the bridge opened to traffic in 1931. During its first full year of operation in 1932, more than 5.5 million vehicles crossed the six-lane roadway. Language was one of the most urgent concerns for immigrants and refugees arriving in New York. It shaped job prospects, social life, status, housing, and neighborhood. Younger arrivals were able to pick up English more easily, but adults, including the breadwinners for families, were at a significant disadvantage. When I was born, my grandmother was living with us, and she took care of me. And uh, so uh, I learned German really before I learned English, because she spoke German. They spoke German among themselves. Um, and my, so my grandmother was really my caretaker. My, my father worked. My mother helped him sometimes in the business. Um, so my grandmother was the one who, who really took care of me. And I have you know, very fond memories of her. Once refugees found employment, they could look for a better apartment. Washington Heights was a popular choice owing to the availability and affordability of rental units. The Heights, they're selling land on Dykeman Street, uh, which intersects Seaman Avenue where we live. Dykeman Street is really 200th Street in Manhattan. Uh, it's a major thoroughfare going from the East River to the Hudson. 
and this shows the lots that they were carving up. And I remember reading that our building, to Seaman Avenue, had been built, and then there was some defect with the building, and they had to tear it down and, and start over. <laughs> Interesting. Of the 125,000 German Jewish refugees that arrived in America in the 30s and 40s, about half came to New York. Refugees from Berlin and northern regions of Germany gravitated to the Upper West Side and Queens, while those from southern Germany and more rural communities preferred Washington Heights. Okay, so here we have immigrants. Now, your, your parents weren't part of it. Do you My remember, parents were not. Do you remember how they related to Holocaust uh, survivors? Do you remember what, uh, when, they, when survivors started coming and, and uh, what it meant, let's say, to either to your social life or religious life? Or did you I have, do remember, have new kids uh, in school? Well, I do remember, actually, uh, because my mother's brother, and I wrote an article for the New York Times on this, my mother's brother, the firstborn in the family, Sillard, um, who was, um, uh, uh, I guess he, she, he was two when she was born, and by the time the last one was um, uh, he was trying to get out of Berlin with his wife. Um, they were living in Berlin, uh, in, in Wilmersdorf, and there's a whole uh, uh, file of letters traffic that documents this. So they're trying to get out. They couldn't get the visa. Anyway, um, so while they were trying to get out of, uh, of Germany, and again, this is just about the time I was born. I was born in 41, and they were deported in 42 from um, from Slovakia, um, but they had sent ahead a whole bunch of things, and we had a closet at home that was full of some things that they had sent ahead. I don't know how it happened or how, you know, uh, but they were fully expecting or hoping to come to America. So we had this black closet full of things that we know came from uh, Uncle Sillard and Aunt Hella, his wife. And I also knew that these kids were showing up in my school, uh, in my Hebrew school, uh, who had all kinds of strange stories. There was one family that suddenly had two little girls from the Netherlands. Um, and, you know, at that age, <laughs> I didn't know where they came from. Um, but that was part of, you know, the, the trauma of growing up in, the, in those years. You suddenly heard stories, you couldn't make any sense of it. But anyway, they, their parents had been killed, I guess, and deported. So they were here. And then I had a, a kid in my Hebrew school class, I think back on this often, who had a speech impediment because he was gagged during the war. Oh. And did, were your parents uh, candid about what was going on no, in Europe? No, they were not, uh, because nobody talked about it then. Uh, I mean, I was smart enough to, to see the headlines and to, you know, I mean, I was beginning to read. Um, so you could sense that there was something going on. Dykeman Street had, was, was a great thoroughfare. I mean, it had two movie theaters and hobby stores that I would buy Did it my feel, did Dykeman Street ever feel like a Jewish ghetto? Or uh, it well, was always it, just a... Um, it was Jewish-Irish. It was very uh -huh. much split down the middle. Uh -huh. um, and I think they used to say that the Irish part of Inwood was west of Broadway and the Jewish part was east. I'm, I'm not sure of that. Did you feel that though? I, mean, uh, I didn't feel, I knew that we, we shared the neighborhood okay, with Irish right. kids who would victimize us. Uh, Good Shepherd was the big church on um, uh, Broadway and like 2 12th or so and we were often afraid maybe more than justified that we, you know, we'd get beat up by the kids from Good Shepherd because they would always, it was always in the um, you know, discussion at school, oh, the Good Shepherd kids are coming after you, you know. 
So we learned that the, the names of Catholic schools was something to be feared. You know, Lady Queen of Martyrs. Uh, uh, it was it was very strange. Um, Did they wear varsity jackets or anything? Yeah, yeah. It was about that. Yeah, it was about neighborhood jackets. gangs. And, and there were gangs. And there, there were gangs, real gangs. The real Sabers. Gangs. I had a friend. A friend. I, I knew a guy in junior high. He was a kid. I still remember him. Fred Shapiro, uh, who was a member of the Sabers. He had a gang jacket. And one day in in class, he nudged me and he said, look down, and he had a huge pistol uh, in the classroom. It, it had a barrel, you know, like that. It was almost like Shapiro a rifle. Doesn't, doesn't sound like a threatening name, but it, well, he was. He, once he uh, read the gang, he was nice to gang, me. Right? Okay. But the gangs were, there were a lot of gangs there. Uh, Inwood was, uh, that was the, the, the 50s, the age of juvenile delinquency and, and street gangs, and they had rumbles, and we were not part of that. Kept, you know, clear that we <laughs> obviously. Your mothers kept you close to home, or? Yeah, yeah. We, we just wasn't, that wasn't our world. No, 181st was very vibrant, and it was distinguished mainly by the Coliseum, which was a real movie palace on the corner, the north west corner of 181st and Broadway. Right, and the Saturday night was full of German Jewish kids or everyone? Well, I couldn't get there too often uh -huh. because you'd have to, first of all, I had no dates. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, I had any dates. Uh, once I had that, a date. Once know, that I comes had. with genius, Ralph. Right? I guess. Yeah, yeah. Go um, but, um, uh, but we would sometimes take the bus when I got older. Mostly we went to the Alpine uh, on Dykeman Street. The Alpine, there was a Lowe's too further down towards Nagel. Uh, but the Alpine is where I used to line up with my friends to see the latest Hopalong Cassidy movie. We'd religiously make sure we saw it as soon as it uh, opened. But I do remember the people sitting outside the Dykeman House. Now the Dykeman House is a real, you know, neighborhood uh, treasure, artifact going back to the 1700s, 204th and Broadway. <coughs> it's an actual Dutch farmhouse that's one of the you know great relics of sure. the colonial period. So did and that become a social spot? Outside there were benches and all the old people would sit on the benches and we young people would go by and laugh at them. You know, they'd be sitting there in the sun, all wrinkled and taking the sun. Uh, <coughs> so <coughs> We also had Fort Tryon Park. We had Inwood Park. We had a lot of parks. Um, and um, that was a great feature of the neighborhood. Uh, so people were always in the park, uh, sitting on benches. I don't remember them taking the, you didn't need these, uh, except maybe in Washington Heights, but not in Inwood. Not in Inwood, because you had that park, like, it runs through the middle of the community. Through the middle of the community. And we had the Triangle, which was a little park, the corner of Broadway. There was an actual Triangle, uh, Riverside Drive. <coughs> Broadway and Dykeman, um, and in the winter <coughs> they would put up a Christmas tree there, and the whole community would gather to sing Christmas carols, Jews, Christians, um, everybody. It was a very wonderful night of coming together, and nobody, you know, um, thought, uh, you know, was that no, it was too religious in context right, to, to join. Right, it was kind of secular. Now, we uh -huh. didn't do that for lighting the, the, okay. the Hanukkah candles. Okay. There was no counterpart for that. Right. But, um, but that was nice. That was a nice, we had a lot of Christian friends, and we would all come together to sing Christmas carols at the, at the Triangle. Uh, one more thing. <clears throat> Um, Passover seders on holidays. Was there something special done on Passover? Yeah, my grandmother would do the seder, and <coughs> I would go. <coughs> um, I would go. I, I, you know, we'd be, be in her apartment on 213 Bennett Avenue, which is opposite Bennett Park, mm -hmm. and she would have. Her, she had remarried then, as I said, Heinrich Pohl, so he had. As I said, these four brothers and a sister. So all the, those those kids came. It was came. a full house. It was a full house, and there might have been 20 people there, 25 people. And uh, my grandfather made some of his own wine, and he had an old uh, for Hanukkah an old-fashioned menorah with oil. But for Pesach, uh, my grandmother would make chicken, and she would make her own barshes, and um, I would watch her, uh, cook, you know, cook the chicken and. Uh, um, uh, I was her darling. She, I think I was her favorite, uh, mainly, mainly because um, my sister came along four years later, but uh, and she lived with me and, and she took care of me. So she was uh, very devoted to me, and, uh, and, I, and she used to keep me in the kitchen, and let me watch everything she did. Anyway, she joined Ohab Sholom, and so we all 
joined, and I was trained, I, I studied for my bar mitzvah there with Rabbi Neuhaus and uh, Canton Ralph Newman. Um, and um, um, I want to say, because I made a note to tell you, mm -hmm. that my bar mitzvah was very simple, and not like today where people rent, you know, fancy halls and they have bands, it's nothing like that. We had, it was catered in, <laughs> in the temple basement. Uh, my mother hand typed the invitation um, with the menu, you know, um, and it was right after the ceremony, so people went, went down to the social hall in the basement, and that was it. Uh, I mean, I made a good haul, I got great presents. Uh, was that the uh, typical fair? Was that what, what other people were doing? That was what everybody did. Uh, nobody no did one was it. ostentatious. Nobody was ostentatious. My friends got bar mitzvahed at Beth Am, mm -hmm. um, and they also had very, I mean, I think they did it a little more uh, you know, a little fancier, but would you uh, say more American? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe because they weren't Orthodox, mm -hmm. um, and um, but um, in my case, it was very, very simple. Um, <coughs> and of course, there were a lot of bombings because we all turned thirteen about the same time. Um, but. Um, now I remember uh, to study for my bar mitzvah, I, uh, Rabbi, Noy, uh, Rabbi uh, Newman, Cantor Newman. Cantor Newman made me a record, a 78, you know, uh, vinyl record that I would play. And the summer before my bar mitzvah, we uh, rented a cabin up in the Adirondacks, and we got used, used the social hall, which was empty in the morning, uh, where I would have to go and play my record on the Victrola and practice along with it, memorizing it. So um, I remember that. And I remember uh, Tanta uh, Newman as, as a very, um, uh, you know, not intimidating, really very friendly. Neuhaus was scary. The rabbi was very scary. And when he uh, would, um, you know, uh, make his sermons, all the kids would run out because we were considered it, w it wasn't necessary for us to be here. Now, now I look back and I think that was probably the most important thing. Forget, forget all the prayers. We should have been there for the sermon because he made points about, you know, living the good life and eth ethics and all that. But anyway, somehow we weren't expected to to participate in the, in the sermon so we could all run out and congregate and socialize and look at the girls. But I had fond memories. I mean, it was a, a, a good community and, you know. And Cantor uh, Newman was, a, was a, a softer, gentler person? He was a softer, that? gentler person, easier to take, you know. And Neuhaus was scared. He had a beard. He looked like a biblical prophet. Uh -huh. And he had a very a booming voice, a booming voice, yeah. a really intimidating voice and kind of blazing eyes, as I remember. And um, uh, he, he was uh, almost like God. I mean, you, you, as a kid, you look at and you try to think of your conception of God. It would look like, you know, Rabbi Neuhaus. Were you, um, you went off to university, obviously. Your whole generation did, right? It wasn't? Yeah, I okay. went to City College. Right. Um, first, I went to music and art. Uh, right. We had neighbors who had gone there, and I was, I was. Watch your step. I was talented in art, and they, they tutored me in, you know, the test, how to, what they're going to ask in the test. So I, I don't know if I would have passed on my own, but they helped mm -hmm. me. Um, but um, I went to music, and then went to City College. Okay. You got a ton of stuff. Yeah, we really did. <coughs> that was really enlightening. I